The reading comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. It's headed, The Birth of Jesus Foretold. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel. Since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born born, will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was set to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. Thank you, Carol. Let's pray as we come to God's word. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would give us ears to hear. We pray that you would give us eyes to see you and wills to obey. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Prayer is at the heart of the Christian life. Charles Spurgeon, the great 19th century prince of preachers, once described prayer as the slender nerve that moves the muscle of omnipotence. You like that? The the slender nerve that moves the muscle of omnipotence. Bit of a a mouthful, but wonderful. He said, prayer is the natural outgushing of a soul in communion with Jesus. Just as the leaf and the fruit will come out of the vine branch without any conscious effort on the part of the branch, but simply because of its living union with the stem, so prayer buds and blossoms and fruits out of a soul, out of souls abiding in Jesus. The Canadian psychologist uh, David Benner calls, soul, uh, calls prayer the soul's native language. Yet even so, that doesn't mean that it comes naturally or easily to any of us. Learning a language, even our native language, can be time-consuming and difficult. I think, for instance, uh, even if... Uh, your, our, our kids, uh, as they're growing up and they're learning language, especially Maddie, uh, trying to grapple with the English language, English language's irregularities. Um, so, if, you know, the opposite of better, you would think, would be worse. That's what she would say. No, it's worse. 
Learning a language isn't always easy. And therefore, starting uh, today and through uh, the Sundays of December uh, to, to come, we're going to be exploring together five prayers, uh, traditionally called a pentad of prayer. A, a pentad just means a group of five, uh, with which Luke begins his gospel story. And they're named uh, after uh, the, each, uh, the first words of each prayer in the old Latin translation of the Bible. So we've got today the Fiat Mihi, uh, the Magnificat, the Benedictus, the Gloria in Excelsis, and the Nunc Dimittis. Now these five prayers, Eugene Peterson writes, articulate a language of listening and believing, a language of uh, receptive and responsive participation as God speaks the life of Jesus and the Jesus community into existence. And they are therefore a wonderful resource for us as we seek to become more fluent in our soul's native language. All the more so in an Advent season in which we're particularly conscious of life's precariousness. In fact, the word precarious is the Latin, is uh, where our, uh, is the Latin word from which our word prayer comes. Life is precarious, and so we pray. And so we begin today with the Fiat Mihi, which I know sounds a little bit like an Italian-made hatchback, but uh, it comes from the first two Latin words of Mary's response, uh, which we read in verse 38. Uh, Mary's response to the angel's incredible message that God had chosen her to be the mother of the Messiah. Verse 38, may your word to me be fulfilled. Other translations have it, let it be with me according to your word. Let it be. Fiat mihi. Let it be. Now, I suspect that you hear the words let it be and you think of a certain Liverpudlian pop boot group. Anyone? No? Yes? Yes? Think of that song, when I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom. And in my hour of darkness, she's standing right in front of me, speaking words of wisdom. You know, I was, I was preparing uh, for, for this sermon, I discovered that the inspiration for this song came from a, a dream that Paul McCartney had during a, a very tense period in the late 60s, uh, as cracks in the band were apparently beginning to appear, uh, and the possibility of them splitting up was becoming very real. And apparently in the dream, his mother, Mary, um, who was a, herself a devout Catholic, visited him, comforting him with the words, it will be all right. Just let it be. And so it, it seems then that the lyrics weren't actually intended to refer to Mary, the mother of Jesus, as some people thought. And yet we can hear in them still the words of Mary herself. His mother's words echoed the Mary that we see here uh, in the gospel story. And this story is probably so well known and so familiar to us uh, that it probably ceases to amaze us and surprise us anymore as it should do. So just think, for instance, of uh, how the story starts in verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. Now, this verse alone, this one verse, tells us so much that we just often gloss over. First, what God is doing with Mary isn't an isolated event. It's part of a much bigger narrative of God's involvement with the world, seeking to rescue it and to restore it to himself. Before the angel even arrives at Mary's house, God has already been at work preparing the way. He's visited the old, old priest, Zachariah, scared and witless in the temple, and told him that he and his elderly, childless wife, Elizabeth, would conceive the boy who's to become John the Baptist. 
these simple words remind us that, that God's interactions with us don't happen in isolation. We're part of this bigger salvation story that he's been working out since before the foundation of the world. And second, let's pause to consider the significance of the words, God sent the angel Gabriel. How often is, have you come across an angel in your life? This is something dramatic, something out of the ordinary. Now, contrary to most Christmas cards and almost every uh, children's nativity play put on at this time of year, the angels aren't sweet little cherubs who hover about with harps on clouds. No, in the Bible, the angels are God's messengers. They're warriors of light. And there's a, ve- you know, there's a very good reason why every time an angel appears in the Bible, what do they say? Don't be afraid. Why? Because you see them, you'd be terrified. It's not a sweet little six-year-old dressed up with, you know, frilly, you know, whatever. <laughs> you get the picture. Their appearance is enough to put the fear of God into you, Literally. And what's more, the Bible demonstrates that the angelic realm is real. And it's clear also that it's quite rarely seen. You know, I can only think of one time uh, where, uh, there aren't many times, but there are just a couple of times in the Bible where someone encounters an angel uh, and they're oblivious to it. One is Balaam, uh, when an angel stands in front of him with a drawn sword And he's so blind to spiritual reality that he can't see it. His donkey does. He can't. And the other time is Mary Magdalene at the resurrection team. And she's so blinded by grief. Two angels standing right in front of her saying, why are you crying? She doesn't even notice that they're angels. When you find an angel, when an angel finds you rather, you know about it. And so the, that, the very fact that Luke starts his account of the Annunciation by saying that God sent the angel Gabriel is for him to say that something really, really significant is happening. And let's be sure to notice this. The person doing it is God. God is the subject of the verb. God is the one doing the sending. God is the one making things happen. And the third thing, just from this very first verse of the passage uh, that Luke says, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth. Now, Nazareth was uh, was to kind of Roman-occupied Judea what Osset is to the United Kingdom. I'm sorry to break this to you, (laughs) but... Had we not moved here, the, my, my, my in-laws who are here from the States today would had, have no idea where Osset is. I'm sorry. Think of Nazareth like that. Uh, and yet it's precisely there that the angel Gabriel comes. However much you might love Osset as, uh, as your hometown, the fact is that it's just simply not on most people's maps. And Nazareth was just a, a, a small village, probably no more than four acres. It was nestled into the bottom of a valley, and surrounded by higher ridges. Uh, and judging by Nathaniel's comments in, at the beginning of John's Gospel, can anything good come from Nazareth? Well, I think we can probably guess that it wasn't held in the highest of esteem. What's more, scholars think that Mary could have been as young as 13 when the angel visited her. You put all of these jigsaw pieces together and you ask yourself the question, who would have expected God's angel to come to a poor virgin girl betrothed to a carpenter from a backwater village of Nazareth in Roman-occupied Judea with the news that she would be the mother of God in the flesh? 
you are piling a lot of incredible things onto, onto each other right there. And that's just ver- the first verse of this reading. It's unthinkable. It's unimaginable. It's out of this world. Nobody could have seen that coming. And yet that's precisely the context in which Mary's prayer, the fiat mihi, is uttered. And Eugene Peterson draws out the significance of this, saying this. He says, prayer begins when God addresses us. First, God speaks. Our response, our answer is prayer. This is basic to understanding the practice of prayer. We never initiate prayer, even though we think we do. Something has happened. Someone has spoken to us before we open our mouths, whether we remember or are aware of it or not. Just as we learn to speak our mother tongue by first being immersed in the language of our mothers and fathers, siblings and others, so we learn prayer in response to what is being said to us over and over by the Holy Spirit in scripture and song, in story, in sermon, in heart whispers and bold witness. Prayer is responsive speech. We've said it already uh, as we gathered for our prayer meetings uh, earlier this month. Prayer is as much, if not more, about listening than it is about speaking. We speak to God because God has spoken to us. And before Mary prays that prayer, let it be with me according to your word. God has already been at work since the foundation of the universe, preparing for this very moment Prayer might seem like it's our our idea, but it's not. We don't begin the conversation. Rather, prayer is participation in a conversation that's already been going on for centuries. It's participation in a conversation that God has begun with us, seeking to engage us through creation, through the, the calling and history of his people, through the scriptures, and above all now through his son, Jesus. And what this means for us is that prayer is about listening. To clasp our hands together in prayer is not to initiate something, but to respond to someone. In other words, it's not up to us to make the running in prayer. Confronted by the reality of God, it's as if we've been asked a question and the choice is how or even if we will respond. So God accosts Mary out of the blue through the angel Gabriel. You're beautiful with God's beauty, the angel tells her. He explains that she'll become pregnant, give birth to the Messiah, the saviour, the heir to King David's throne, for whom Israel has been watching and waiting for centuries. But how? I've never slept with anyone, Mary replies. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The angel explains, and did you know, the angel continues, that your cousin Elizabeth conceived a son, old as she is? Everyone called her barren, and here she is, six months pregnant. Why does that matter? Well, because it shows that no word from God will ever fail. Unbelievable as the angel's message to Mary is, the point is that God has a proven track record of doing the impossible. God has spoken, God is calling, and yet God won't coerce. It is genuinely up to us to respond. And it's here that Mary utters this short, simple, but dangerous prayer, the fiat mihi. I am the Lord's maid, she says, ready to serve. Let it be with me just as you say. Mary's prayer is one of acquiescence, one of submission, one of surrender, of putting herself at God's disposal. She doesn't understand it. She's already said that, but how? 
but she's willing to entrust herself to God on the basis of his words, the word that never fails. Mary hasn't asked for this. She hadn't been praying and pleading, oh, please make me the mother of the Messiah. It will be costly to her. The scandal of a child born outside of wedlock in a tiny conservative village where everybody knows your name, everybody knows your business. Not to mention the pain of then having to watch your son die, the most horrific death imaginable. Yet Mary's willing to receive this assignment of hers, not because it's easy, but because it's from God. The fiat mihi is the response of faith to the God who invites us to partner in his saving purposes for the world. And so the fiat mihi isn't just a a weak shrug of the shoulders kind of prayer. Okay. It's an active, courageous yes to God's yes to her. It's not a fatalistic resignation. You know what I mean? A kind of que sera, sera. What will be, will be. It's a deliberate choice that she makes. An act of willing. An act of willing surrender. The posture of the fiat mihi isn't a shrug of the shoulders. It's not, uh, it's a courageous leap of faith. Mary doesn't study uh, God's word to her, seeking to discern divine principles by which to live. Neither does she seek to apply uh, God's word to her life. Instead, she just consents to having, letting God's word have its way with her. She relinquishes control. She surrenders. Mary doesn't insist on her own terms and conditions. She submits. I am the Lord's servant, she says. She receives God's word, takes God at his word, and welcomes his word to take up residence in her. The fiat mihi is Mary's way of saying, you drive the car and take me wherever you want me to go. And so to pray the fiat mihi and to mean it is to place our life in God's hands. Henry Nouwen, who's a a Dutch priest, professor and author, likened this kind of faith to that of a a trapeze troupe. What he realised was that the flyer isn't really the star of the show. Everyone's eyes are on the one that flies But what most people didn't see was that their aerial acrobatics were only possible because they had total trust that they'd be caught. And so translating this into the life of faith, Nouwen said, if we're to take risks, to be free in the air, in life, we have to know there's a catcher. We have to know that when we come down from it all, we're going to be caught We're going to be safe. The great hero is the least visible. Trust the catcher. So Mary's fiat mihi is her recognition that before she could fly through the air, she would need to let go of the bar by placing her whole trust in God, the catcher. And throughout the century, Mary, uh, throughout the centuries, Mary has often been celebrated as the, the archetypal Christian. She models the responsiveness of faith that hears the word of God, takes God at his word, receives that word into the very depth of her being and allows that word to go uh, to work conceiving Christ in her. God calls us, like Mary, to bear Christ within us. And if the life of Christ is to be conceived in us by the Holy Spirit, it will be because we, like Mary, have surrendered to God's words. And yet a prayer like the fiat me, he isn't just the kind of prayer that launches us in the Christian way. Rather, it's the kind of prayer that characterizes the life of faith all the way along. 
It's a prayer that we must keep coming back to again and again and again, praying afresh in every new day, in every new situation. Let it be with me according to your words. Having surrendered once, we must make surrender our way of life, resisting the urge to try and kind of take back a bit of the steering wheel. God speaking to us today, just as he spoke to Mary. What's he saying to you, and how are you going to respond? You know what, there may be some here today, may have been coming to church for a long time, but yet never invited God into the driver's seat of their lives. You've may never have actually said that loud, unequivocal yes to God's yes to you. Well, say yes to him today. And perhaps your response to God up to now has kind of been tentative. Maybe it's been written in pencil rather than pen with pages and pages of your own terms and conditions. Yes, I'll follow you if This, if that, 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 if that. Yes, but. Perhaps today, it's time to lose the but. And like Mary, just say yes. Let God set the terms. Trusting him that he won't let you fall. And perhaps there's a particular situation that you're facing, that you're going through at the moment, in which God is looking for your fiat mihi today. Is God inviting you to partner with him in his saving work? And perhaps it's a situation that seems too daunting too big, too much for you to cope with. And maybe God is asking you, can you say, let it be with me according to your words? Will you let go of the bar? And will you let God catch you? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, let it be with us according to your word. Whatever you have for us, whatever lies ahead, we say yes. And Lord, where we have added our own terms and conditions... Lord, would you take away those buts and help us to trust that when we surrender ourselves to you, you will catch us. And because we know you will catch us, we can fly through the air. Lord, like Mary, would we be those in whom your word is planted, takes root, grows, and is made visible to the world. Amen.